I mean, the truth is, first of all, uh, that our inflation had hit 5.5%, almost three times the 2% target, before the Ukraine war broke out. So we mm -hmm. had an endemic inflation problem in the economy before the Ukraine war. Uh, the second piece of evidence I would deduce is that, yes, of course, uh, all countries that imported energy, including Japan and Switzerland and China, uh, experienced energy price inflation. But those three countries, China, Japan and Switzerland, did not print all this money and buy all these bonds. And so it did not translate into a high general inflation in those countries in the way that it did in America, European area and the United Kingdom. Hello and welcome to the IAA's YouTube channel. My name is Christian Niemitz and I am the head of political economy here. And I'm joined today by Sir John Redwood, uh, MP for Wokingham, a position which he's held since 1987, um, and a former cabinet minister, shadow cabinet minister, um, prolific author and commentator, runs the website johnredwood.com with commentary on economic and monetary policy. And uh, he's going to talk about his new paper, The New Great Inflation, which is based on a lecture that he gave at All Souls College uh, at Oxford. Uh, John, thank you for joining us. Um, as you know, in the early decades of the existence of this institute, uh, inflation was a big deal. So my predecessors mm -hmm. here, people who worked here in earlier decades, would have written and said quite a lot about it. Uh, but now a whole generation has basically grown up that has never known high inflation. Uh, from the early 90s until, well, less than two years ago, we used to think inflation is kind of a topic of the past a bit, uh, economic history, uh, 1970s problem. Did you expect that you would see inflation rates of that magnitude again? And, well, what went wrong? Well, I didn't expect that for quite a long time because uh, as a very young man, I've been involved in those early battles which led to the Margaret Thatcher government of 1979 and they had a very bitter battle to fight against the inherited inflation. It was quite damaging to the economy to get the inflation down. But once they'd got it down, uh, it was then possible to follow policies that contained it. And so I, like many other people uh, in the first couple of decades of this century, felt that it was yesterday's problem. Yeah. But when I saw what the Bank of England and the Treasury were doing over COVID, uh, with another major round of quantitative easing and bond buying on top of the one uh, they used to try and get over the banking crash of 10 years earlier, I did become alarmed. And I, mm -hmm. I started saying, when we were into the recovery, that they were going too far and that if they kept interest rates that depressed and if they paid ever sillier prices for bonds, the inflation would spill over. They'd, they'd already triggered a massive asset price inflation because they drove the price of bonds up, they were inflated, yeah. and then that drove the price of shares up because quite a lot of people who sold the bonds at high prices to the government uh, then bought shares with them. It drove the price of property up. So we had an asset inflation. There was always the danger it was spread into a general inflation, but those of us who warned about this were ignored. Was there a point of no return? Do you think it could still uh, have been stopped in, say, 2021, two years ago? Or was it once we've had the lockdown and the, quanti uh, the quantitative easing that there was no return from that? Well, I and many others judged that the first response to lockdown was essential, that too much activity had been destroyed, there was too much deflation. Yeah. So I and others were enthusiastic supporters of the first 300 billion <laughs> quantitative easing, to be truthful about it. But it was the last 150 billion of quantitative easing done in 2021, when the recovery was well underway, that some of us got alarmed about. Now, you can't be quite sure what actually did the damage, but I, I think it was that last big tranche, quantitative easing, mm -hmm. into a market which was recovering. And with asset prices already uh, moving up quite sharply, that, that did the damage. Yeah, people at the Bank of England and their defenders would, of course, say, well, it's the Ukraine war. It's the increase in the energy price and, to a lesser extent, food prices. But I take it from the paper that you're not convinced by that. Well, that was part of the manifestation of it. But the, I mean, the truth is, first of all, uh, that our inflation had hit 5.5%, almost three times the 2% target, before the Ukraine war broke out. So we mm -hmm. had an endemic inflation problem in the economy before the Ukraine war. Uh, the second piece of evidence I would deduce is that, yes, of course, 
uh, all countries that imported energy, including Japan and Switzerland and China, uh, experienced energy price inflation. But those three countries, China, Japan and Switzerland, did not print all this money and buy all these bonds. And so it did not translate into a high general inflation in those countries in the way that it did in America, European area and the United Kingdom, who had uh, fueled the inflation with all the extra bond printing. So I think the evidence is quite clear uh, that those parts of the world that went for too expansionary a monetary policy on top had a general inflation, whereas those that contained their money and credit a bit better mm -hmm. um, had a sharp increase in energy prices, but not the same general inflation. Indeed, Chinese inflation today is zero. Japanese inflation has been around 3%. Swiss inflation is around 2%. Uh, whereas the Americans, the, the Brits, and the European area had inflation up to around 10%, and it's still far too high. Right, so it's not the case that there is high inflation everywhere. Most mm. economies are somewhat affected, but there are good counterexamples that show yeah. this is still, there is so much policy variation that monetary policy must explain part of it. Yes, indeed, and, and I'm pleased to say it's not just me and a few others asking these questions. Now, the Bank of England are rightly asking this question themselves. And they are asking, why do we get the inflation forecast so wrong? Because a couple of years before inflation hit 11% in the United Kingdom, uh, their two-year forecast was 2%. Mm -hmm. And even after they'd got inflation up to 5 or 6% and the Ukraine war broke out, they were still greatly under forecasting the inflation rate. And so they've now admitted that their models and their inflation forecasting is wrong. And so my, my pamphlet and lecture is designed to try and help them in their thinking, some suggestions, because I don't think they're going to get their models right unless and until they include some money and credit variables that have some significance in the algorithm and model they use. And the, the check surely must be, can they get their model to forecast what has happened or somewhere near what has happened? Because very clearly they couldn't forecast what has happened. It was disastrously wrong. And the, the really crucial thing the Bank of England has to get right in its forecast is the rate of inflation, mm. because the whole point of their monetary policy committee is to keep that rate to around 2%. And how do you know what policies to adopt if you've no idea what the rate's going to be? Has anyone got this more or less right? Uh, did, say, uh, the countries that you mentioned, say Switzerland, do they mm. have a very different type of modelling? Or is there not just a general over-reliance on quantitative modelling and that uh, you would then say, well, the computer says no, therefore there can't be a problem here? Well, it's um, difficult to test that out because, of course, they didn't follow the same policies. And so their right. policies uh, didn't produce the same results, um, whether that's because they had the right variables in their model or whether they were just making better judgments about policy, I can't be sure. Uh, but one way or another, we need to understand how it was that some reputable central banks forecast lower inflation and kept inflation lower, and other reputable central banks forecast low inflation and got it hopelessly wrong. And I'm pleased that the Bank of England sees they've got to do something about that. I would urge them to get on with it. I, I mm. think leaving it until next spring is very late because it's very important they get the judgments right now and it would be easier to make the right judgments if they had more confidence in their forecasts. Right. In the paper, uh, you also questioned the idea that central banks are as independent as they are on paper. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about that, central bank independence? Well, I, I don't think there can be an independent central bank. These are all bodies owned by the state and ultimately financed by the state. Uh, certainly the United Kingdom, the, the bank is 100% owned by the state and it insisted on a complete guarantee against all losses on the bonds it was buying. And currently the Treasury stroke taxpayer uh, is having to pay enormous sums of money to the Bank of England uh, to pay for all the losses they're now choosing to take on their bonds. And the, the main part of monetary policy in the last 13 or 14 years since the banking crash has been the decision on how much money to print and how many bonds to buy or how much money to shrink and how many bonds to sell. And that in the United Kingdom was expressly a dual control policy. The, the bank had to get the support or agreement of the Chancellor Exchequer, who then had to sign a binding memorandum uh, that on behalf of the taxpayers, he would stand behind the, the bonds that they were buying or selling. So that very clearly doesn't look very much like an independent bank. 
In the case of the United States of America, the Federal Reserve Board um, is said to be independent in some ways. It, it's independent, as with the Bank of England. They, both those banks make the decision about short-term interest rates on their own. Uh, but under the Fed's constitution, they have to balance a growth requirement with an inflation requirement. Uh, like the Bank of England, they have to go to the elected body, in their case, the Congress, and answer for their policies and defend their policies. And when President Biden took over as president in the United States, uh, two vice chairmen of the Federal Reserve Board retired early, and they were Republican appointees, and good Democrats were put in, and I see nothing wrong with that, but it's not the action of an independent central bank, it's clearly the action of a, of a central bank that needs rightly to cooperate with the Treasury Secretary, in the case of the United States of America, who happens to be the former head of the central bank anyway. So it would only be a completely independent central bank would only be possible if they were also completely responsible for their own finances and if there were a possibility of them going bankrupt, which would, of course, defeat the whole purpose of their existence. Well, I mean, arguably, as the Fed would say, they can't go bankrupt mm. because they can print money. And so what the Fed says now that it, like the Bank of England, is, is facing very large losses on its bonds, um, the Fed says, well, we're not going to get uh, all the losses repaid in the way the Bank of England does by taxpayers. We're just going to put them on our balance sheet. But you needn't worry because we pay all our bills anyway. Mm. We can create as many dollars as we like and another day we'll start making profits again. And I think everybody will accept that. But no, I, I don't think you can have a really independent central bank in a democracy unless all political parties over a very long time period uh, don't want to influence the appointments to the board of the body. I don't know who would appoint the people, but you can't have the politicians appointing them because there's obviously room for inference. Mm. You, you couldn't allow any changes in the remit or the aims of the body. Uh, you would presumably be, have to be very careful about the body, the bank, having to go to defend itself in front of the elected representatives because that's presumably to influence the people. It's not just a waste of time. You need to make a lot of changes to the current arrangements over appointments, remit and accountability uh, if you wanted it to be genuinely independent. So better to work with what we have. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm saying continuity, but I'm just asking people to be realistic. When, when yeah. they say it's independent, they, they cannot explain what that means. I mean, the German Central Bank for a long period uh, was as ne near to being independent as you can because it so happened there was party agreement just to leave it alone and they liked what it was doing because it was coming up with a low inflation policy. But then two really big issues arose uh, and one was how did you amalgamate the Deutsche Mark with the Ostmark in order to bring the two Germanys together. The central bank very, gave very good advice that the politicians route would be inflationary and the politicians overrode the central bank and said there's a political imperative that we yeah. do it one Ostmark to one Deutsche Mark, so that showed it wasn't independent. And then, of course, <laughs> even more extraordinary, was shortly afterwards the politicians said, and by the way, we're abolishing our own currency altogether. And so the currency that is the very incorporation of German economic independence is going to disappear, and you're yeah. going to have to live with that as well. So, and I rest my case, the, the famous German central bank uh, was brought down by two monumentally important political decisions. And even there, even as long as it did work and it was independent, that required a political culture of uh, almost paranoid protectiveness of this uh, independence principle. I think there was one uh, episode where government might have been Helmut Schmidt in the early 80s, mm. where they did try to pressure the Bundesbank mm. uh, into adopting a looser monetary policy, and they then told the press, and it was a minor political scandal, uh, with people saying, how dare they interfere with mm. our Bundesbank. And, yeah, and that was politics. And as I say, it was, it was possible for it to be as near to independent as a central bank can be, only because there was a political consensus. Yeah. But as soon as the bank starts making mistakes, if the bank ends up with high inflation, you can't stop that becoming a political issue. And you can't stop political parties having different views on it. Indeed, in a proper democracy with choice, you'd want mm. the parties to what have different happen? views sure. on yeah. it. And then some of them will disagree with the bank. And you've got to live with that because politics takes over because it matters so much to the people and the bank has let them down. Mm. Well, on, and on that note, bank uh, letting people down, uh, one reason I suspect why there has been less scrutiny that there could be is that there have been all sorts of red herrings floating around. Um, perhaps the most fashionable one uh, the, being the idea of greedflation, uh, the idea mm. that uh, excess profits are really driving inflation, uh, which I always 
thought was a bit of a strange explanation because it sounds like as if you were trying to explain a plane crash by saying, oh, it's gravity that caused it. Um, <laughs> or you're, you're kind mm. of implying that from 1992 to 2021, uh, companies were less greedy and then they suddenly decided, oh, let's be really super greedy. Uh, but do you think there's any, uh, ex any validity in this greedflation excess profit argument? Well, I mean, it's clearly the case that if you allow an energy price inflation for all sorts of good and bad reasons, uh, then the energy companies will make a lot of extra money because it's a commodity and if they are getting more of it out of the ground at no uh, great extra cost to them, they will make a lot more money. So I think people are concentrated on uh, excess energy profits. A lot of governments have decided that they want to tax that away, which is a different argument about whether you do that or not. But there's no evidence that general profit margins all rose during this very difficult period. And if you take um, a very bitterly contested area like food prices, where there has been all too much food price inflation, when you look at the food retailers, they've actually kept their margins at pretty low levels as they always do yeah. have, because it's a very competitive sector. And they're, they're facing the customer every day, and they know the customers are angry. So the last thing they're going to do is try and go in for green inflation margins because they would be rumbled and their relations with their customers would be very difficult. Yeah, but I mean, the, the greedflation story is just one example of, um, I'd say what happens during periods of high inflation is that it's not just a problem in its own right, but it also poisons economic policy debates. Mm. So I've never seen so many mainstream newspapers calling for measures like price controls. Uh, it's almost, I'm not, I'm not just talking about the usual suspects, it's the sort of thing you would normally expect to read in The Socialist Worker, mm. is what you can now read in mainstream newspapers, um, all in response to these elevated inflation rates. Well, would, you, would you agree that that's... Yes, uh, and, and I can quite understand the anger, because I represent people and, and I know that a lot of these price rises are damaging and very uncomfortable for people. Uh, but I also know from past experiences and watching the way of the world that when, when governments then adopt price controls, um, the short-term effect may be popular, but the medium-term effect is usually very damaging because it reduces the supply. A lot of companies uh, or people making provisions say, I can't afford to do this anymore, I don't want to do it, I don't want it to be that managed. And then the supply is reduced, and then people are worse off because then there's pressures which sometimes can't be resisted, but prices are a clear example. Is the damage being done to the housing market for rent in some places where they introduce rent controls as in Paris or in parts of uh, the Americas and the supply reduces and then the pressures for uh, rents that somehow get around the rules to rise becomes insuppressible. So you have to be very careful not to do something which is short-term popular which ends up reducing supply and making the problem worse. Yeah, in Stockholm they have something like 10 year waits uh, on average for a rental property. Problem is once you have them in place, it may be a panicky response in a period of high inflation, but once you have it in place, uh, you'll never get rid of it again because some people do benefit and uh, they will then be very vocal about keeping it. Yes, but you may have to loosen up the market in some other way to allow yeah. new development, otherwise oh, yeah. the problem just gets worse. and there's something even worse than charging people a lot of rent, and that is not letting them have a home at all. Yeah. Going back uh, purely to uh, the issue of central bank governance, in New Zealand they had a system for a while where, may still have it, where uh, the governor of the central bank had to resign when they continuously failed to meet their inflation target. Now that may be placing too much emphasis on one person, but do you think, broadly speaking, that is the way to go, to have, um, say, to adopt them, the kind of modelling maybe that you would want to see, uh, just to make sure that people in charge of monetary policy have more skin in the game? Well, I'm a friendly person, and so what I've suggested in the pamphlet is, is a positive rather than a negative. So instead of saying, sack the governor when inflation goes up too much, I've said, why don't you make uh, what is pretty high pay for these people, the top team at these central banks, uh, conditional upon meeting the targets. And so there would be a a pretty low basic pay to pay the food bill. But if they want to earn the, the big bucks that they're earning at the moment uh, anyway, they okay. would need to deliver. I think that would be very fair. So more more carrot, less stick yeah, would be carrot. your solution. Yeah, okay, yeah. A nice solution. Um, yeah, I mean, one final question then. Uh, now that inflation of the kind that we thought we had overcome, now that it has happened again, do you think this could become a new normal? Would you be terribly surprised if we saw 
another outbreak like this, say towards the end of the decade, or was this a very exceptional situation with the, the monetary uh, loosening that we saw during COVID? And is this a one-off or could this happen again? Well, I think it's going to be difficult getting inflation back down to under two again. Mm. And I think maybe in some countries they may settle for something a bit higher than two. Um, I, I don't think I want to see the targets change, but I think you may find uh, the enthusiasm for more and more austerity wanes uh, as you get inflation down to a more realistic level. And there is in, an inherent strain in a lot of these countries now because public expenditure has grown so much and yeah. public intervention in, in markets and industry is, is so much bigger now than it was a few years ago uh, that I think they will find containing inflation that much more difficult. Well, on that happy note, Sir John Redwood, thank you very much for joining us today. And the paper is going to be on the website under Research and Publications, uh, The New Great Inflation. Thanks for listening and don't forget to hit the subscribe button.